Thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be able to cross community boundaries a little bit and come to speak to you today. I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of where we're going to go, because my plan is to cover a lot of ground and several different topics. First, I'll start with a little bit of history and context for those of you who maybe haven't heard of Haskell. Uh, and then the main topic for today is to talk about Haskell and how it treats side effects. Uh, so namely, how it limits side effects, how it classifies side effects. Haskell is a zoologist of side effects. And then we'll get in a little bit into my own research area, which has to do with race freedom and deterministic parallel programming. And finally, I want to end by talking a little bit about performance and data representation. So Haskell the language was born in April 1990. It's about 27 years old now, although that effort was actually a consolidation effort where groups of people representing uh, different implementations of functional languages were trying to come together and consolidate. Now this was a new generation of functional language implementers who were reacting against the longtime uh, champions at the time of functional programming, Lisp and ML. Uh, and of course, those languages made compromises. They were impure functional languages that allowed side effects, potentially side effects in any function and every function. And so Haskell's rallying cry was purity. What can we do if we insist that our functional programming language be pure, that we essentially execute mathematics at runtime? So this no compromises approach led people to dream big and try to design custom architectures to actually execute these kinds of programs directly. As you probably know, that didn't turn out successful. But after 20 years or so of research, uh, these kinds of languages can effectively target modern architectures, the computers that we do have today, with this, without compromising this radical idea of executable mathematics. So I'm going to show a fair amount of Haskell code today. And I'd like to start small with a few small snippets here. Uh, this is a function that implements a simple polynomial, x squared plus 3. Uh, this is just a tiny bit of Haskell syntax. You can see we write type signatures separately, like we do in our math classes. Uh, and we say f of x equals x squared plus 3. Uh, so there's no parentheses around the argument there. So this looks a little more like, say, a bash script in how we apply function arguments. And if we had two arguments to our function here, it would look something like this. So the type here is perhaps a little unusual compared to what we see in most programming languages. Uh, it says, I take two integers and return an int, but it's written with two arrows instead of a comma or something. And this, uh, this means that you can actually apply it to one argument instead of two. And when you apply it to one uh, integer, if I say g of three, I get back a function of int to int. So this is what's called curry to function arguments. And this is the norm in Haskell. Now, when we go to apply a function like g here, uh, we would say g three, four and the result would have type int. Uh, we would not say g3, 4. That would actually make sense if g had a different type. So Haskell also has tuples, and this type says, I take an int, comma, int tuple, and I return an integer. Uh, so that's a single tuple argument. Uh, the tuple constructor here is actually one of very few types in Haskell that has a little bit of uh, syntactic shorthand for it. Most type constructors are written uh, in a similar way as to other programming languages that support generics, except without these angle brackets. So a vector type parameterized by the type int would be written like this. So the key part about being a pure programming language is while any programming language would write the x squared plus 3 function in a pure style, uh, when we want to go and do side effects, we actually have to change the type in Haskell. So if we want this function to ignore its arguments and print hello, we're going to have to change the type from int to int to int to int to int to io. Uh, so the return value here is a, uh, what we call IO unit. This empty tuple thing is essentially a void value. It's saying this performs an IO action, but does not return anything interesting to the user. And so these IO actions can be thought of as uh, first class representations of action, imperative actions you want to do. So this is the central compromise at the heart of Haskell. At the end of the day, for a, we run programs for their side effects. We run programs for the stream of system calls that they produce. So some pure mathematical entity would not be observable in the real world. So Haskell is really two languages together. It is a pure language of computation, and then it's a language of imperative actions that have effects upon the world. But the compromise is that you can view these as separate. So essentially, you can run a pure function, which would return a recipe, kind of like a baking recipe, that would say, uh, here's what I want you to do. Print this, print that, mutate this variable. And we can think of these programs as conceptually separate. And we can compose together multiple actions, of course, to build bigger imperative programs. So here, uh, g returns an io int instead of an io unit. And this means it will not only perform an io action, 
but that IO action, when it's finished executing, will return an integer. And the code here says print hello and then return x squared plus y. Now, these really are first class actions, although they're not often used that way. So for instance, we can store IO actions in a vector, and then you could even reverse that vector or scramble its order, and then sequence those actions. So these could be thought of as uh, methods with, or as objects with an execute method. But of course, the compiler tries very hard to never represent them at runtime if it doesn't need to. So code like this is ultimately going to compile very similarly to how it would compile in C or Java or Go. We want to jump to the G function, uh, make a IO call, and then return uh, computing and registers for these results. All right, so the main function, when we start off uh, execution, we start at the main function. So essentially, every Haskell program that runs starts its life as an imperative program. There's a mini Java program living inside every Haskell program. And this is what we sometimes call the imperative spine of the program. And then that uh, main function can execute a series of input-output operations. But it can also call into this purely functional world, calling these uh, actions which are not monadic. We call this, uh, these monads in f -sharp, they're called workflows. Uh, we, in the Haskell community, have often regre regretted giving a relatively inaccessible name to these computational actions uh, drawn from mathematics. But since that's what we call them, I'll just go ahead and call them monads for now. So the, even this main function can conceptually still be thought of as a pure computation that refer, returns this recipe, this list of actions to take at runtime. So in principle, you could separate the implementation so you have a pure engine, which is feeding these actions to some kind of imperative interpreter. But of course, you wouldn't really want to implement, that way, implement it that way. And instead, the instructions you execute at runtime for pure code and imperative code are going to get muxed together, as they should be. All right, so one of the interesting things about Haskell is that it's kind of a research project that escaped the lab. Uh, so this is a slide from Simon Payton Jones. One way that he often describes it is that the vast majority of research languages follow the quick death trajectory. A research group introduces them or an individual and they last for a little while and then, and then end. Then there's the slow death model where maybe a slightly larger research group or team of people use the language for uh, a little more than five years. And then for popular languages, they, they very quickly cross what we think of as the threshold of immortality, where they become so big with so many users, often relatively quickly, in a few years, that um, they, they sometimes become difficult to change after that point, but they'll be around for a long, long time in any case. So Haskell follows this rather unusual trajectory where it seems to be getting a second life. It was introduced in 1990. It sort of skated along as a research thing for functional programming geeks for a long time. But then in the mid to late 2000s, there seemed to be more interest in Haskell, and the number of users started spiking up, and it became a, a bigger community effort. So this is a kind of an unusual practice, and it's caused people to think, well, this is both an opportunity, but we want to make sure that Haskell keeps changing and keeps being a research platform, which it certainly has. The velocity of change has been enormous. The main Haskell implementation is the Glasgow Haskell compiler, and it's mostly become a one implementation language for, for all intents and purposes now. Um, there are between 30,000 and 100,000 Haskell programmers in the world, uh, according to different estimates. So about a 1 to 50 or 1 to 100 ratio to the number of C++ programmers. The latest number I heard from Strewstrip was something like 4.6 million C++ programmers. Uh, so obviously that's a small community, but it's still enough for an interesting community. And it's still enough to begin to ask software engineering questions about Haskell code. So it's a research language, but it's one where we have a package server with tens of thousands of packages and with uh, tens of millions of lines of code where we can start to ask the kinds of questions that people do in the software engineering literature, which often depends on being able to study large existing projects, which is easy in C++ and easy in Java, um, but it's harder to do with more esoteric research languages. I'll give an example of one such software engineering experiment in a little while. The package server I alluded to is called Hackage. Now, everybody's doing this nowadays, and it's a great thing, in my opinion, uh, to have a central package manager that makes it really easy to automatically fetch dependencies for open source software. Haskell was doing it somewhat early. So Haskell started in 2007, and the number of packages has been going up steadily since then. Uh, this is a little out of date. Now we're at 11,000 packages, I think. Um, there are other language communities and package servers with many, many more packages. Of course, this is a metric that's kind of funky, because different language communities vary by at least an order of magnitude in the amount of code per package, for example. But NPM has a, has a crazy number of packages. Uh, Rust is pretty quickly growing to meet Haskell soon. 
Um, but all this code uh, provides an interesting basis for experiments and to see how these things evolve in the wild when people are trying to get their real work done with databases and uh, other real world projects <coughs> using a purely functional language. Because of the setting today, uh, naturally we're drawn to think about Haskell in the context of C++. And I'll be making a few comments about the Haskell C++ history and the Haskell C++ relationship. They're both big languages, they're both old languages, and they're both languages that in spite of being old uh, have continued to change over their lifespan. One of the things we're really proud of in Haskell is in spite of being a big language, it has a very tiny core. So what we call the surface language, what we parse from source files, is in fact a very big language. If you look at the abstract syntax uh, data type inside the compiler, uh, it's got hundreds of different variants in the discriminated union that makes up the abstract syntax tree. So there are a lot of different surface level language features. But inside the middle end of the compiler, all of those boil down to this extremely tight core in a way that few other compilers I'm aware of manage to accomplish. So system FC is this mathematical language that makes up the core of GHC and has been very well studied in the academic literature. And it only has three types and 15 constructors. It's kind of the skinny waist of the GHC compiler. And that's the intermediate representation that's used for most of the optimizations. However, uh, there are, in the back end, it does eventually lower to a more traditional compiler intermediate representation on its way to generating x86 code or LLVM IR. So uh, just to back that up with the actual data type, so this is not a condensation of the actual data type at the heart of GHC. This is the actual data type at the heart of GHC. This is system FC. It's basically a small lambda calculus type language. And even the imperative fragment of the programming language, that IO monad that I was telling you about, boils down to rep being represented in this lambda calculus type form. How do we treat something like the put string primitive operation inside the compiler? Well, it's a function. It's a function that takes a world, the entire universe around us, and returns a new world. Uh, so that's an example of what's called a linear function. Uh, it takes one argument and it returns it back to you without ever using it twice or duplicating it. And in some sense, linear functional programming is kind of equivalent to uh, imperative programming. Okay, so one more little historical note. Uh, Indiana University, where I'm located, uh, has been a place where roads have crossed a little bit in, in these two histories. So we've had uh, some of the C++ and Boost folks at Indiana, like Andrew Lumsdane and Jeremy Seek. Maybe some of you, actually, does anyone know Jeremy or Andrew? Um, great, wow. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, Andrew's moved to University of Washington in Nyack now, but, um, but we very much enjoyed having him as a colleague. And uh, they worked on the Boost Graph Library at Indiana. Uh, but Indiana also has this long tradition of functional programming languages research, dating back to Dan Friedman joining in the early 70s. Uh, so for many years, Indiana was a Lisp and Scheme uh, kind of place. And the graduate students would circ circulate quite a bit between these two different research groups, the systems-oriented research group and the programming languages research group. And I think that was a, a quite fertile process. And some, thing, some things directly came out of it. For example, the uh, the Open Systems Lab published an Uppsala 2003 paper that was a comparative study of different languages' support for generic programming. And they had a table in there where they compared a bunch of different languages along these dimensions that they chose at the time. Now, this was 2003, so this is, this is probably way out of date. Um, but because of this different uh, combination of people that were at IU, Amr Sabri eventually showed this to Simon Peyton Jones, uh, who was uh, the main, uh, one of the main figures in the Haskell world. Uh, and of course, Haskellers got a little upset that there was this, this place that th th they didn't have a full circle. So a mere four years later, they published this paper that closed that hole and added what we call type families, or these uh, functions from type to type in the type system, uh, and even type families that are associated with type classes, uh, a, a feature that some of you may be familiar with. Um, so that had uh, quite a bit of impact in the, Has in the Haskell world. Uh, it was sort of spurred by this work in the C++ and Boost community. Uh, but it recently got a 10-year impact award uh, at our ICFP conference because of all the follow-on research that it engendered. So that's just one little historical story. I think the broader uh, history of language cross-pollination uh, goes back quite a ways. And looking at the particular aspect of functional languages in Haskell and how it cross-pollinates with other languages, Type families was obviously one story that I mentioned on the previous slide. Also, type classes, uh, similar to concepts, similar to traits, are one of the main things that are associated with Haskell and were one of the main inventions of the Haskell community. Standard ML before Haskell, for instance, they didn't have a good type to give the sort function, so they would have to simply pretend that the sort function worked on all types. 
when of course it doesn't. Um, and of course, looking at functional programming more broadly, there have been a number of features that have been um, paraded by functional programmers, encouraged by functional programmers, that have eventually made their way into more mainstream languages. So lambdas and MapReduce style programming, or, or garbage collection even, which was long a feature of Lisp and uh, not very common outside of it. Um, so the slow, the slow adoption curve here is a little bit frustrating because sometimes it takes many decades for even a good idea to percolate out uh, and cross-pollinate between languages. And there are a couple things which I'll be talking about today which really haven't had much main impact on mainstream languages yet, but many of us hope will in the coming decades. So the first one is, uh, is the main thing we're talking about today. It's this notion of purity, controlling the side effects. This is uh, the things that you take away rather than the things that you give. Uh, and it's always easier to add features to a language that are additive rather than subtractive in this way. Um, so there are, different, there are different spins on this. There's pure, purely functional languages. There are type effect systems that take imperative languages and enrich the types to describe the side effects that they perform. Um, there, there are some attempts at this. The Midori system from Microsoft is one very cool example, and I recommend Joe Duffy's blog posts describing it. Um, the second piece that we're very actively working on within the programming languages research community, especially the theory and functional programming side of it, is formal verification techniques to try to scale them up and make them real and make them uh, able to get into the hands of uh, programmers everywhere so that we can reason formally about our code a little bit more and prove correctness properties when we want to. So uh, this purely functional controlled effect idea must be hard because even most of the functional languages still don't do it. And not just the Scheme and Lisp and ML implementations that have been around since the 70s, but new languages such as F Sharp uh, and so on, Scala, uh, naturally are impure functional languages that include side effects. So this is, this is something of a rarity. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. But I want to back up for one second and sh inflict on you one, one more piece of uh, history. So I wanted to tell you how I came to this. And that starts with um, my time at Intel in the developer products division after graduate school, but before I came back to academia to be a professor. So our group there developed parallel programming libraries for C++. Uh, the developer products division actually had maybe too many different offerings in this respect. There were several different uh, libraries being developed, Intel Array Building Blocks, Intel Concurrent Collections, Intel Silk Plus, Threading Building Blocks, some of which are still around today. Um, so while there, I mainly worked on Intel Concurrent Collections, although we also collaborated with the Silk teams and the uh, Threading Building Blocks team. And the basic idea of concurrent collections was very simple. It was a high-level data flow style programming model that could guarantee that your parallel application was deterministic. Uh, so Intel CNC in a nutshell, basically it was a task parallel framework where you structured your compute job as a collection, as a graph really, of what we called compute steps or tasks. And those steps would communicate not through FIFO channels like in some of the data flow models, uh, but they would communicate through these append-only tables. And during the parallel region of the execution, you weren't allowed to delete anything from these tables. And that made the determinism argument uh, simpler. So the only operations that a step should really execute during the parallel region of the program uh, is to put to these tables or do a blocking get to wait until an entry is available in these tables and then read it. And that's it. That's really the whole model. So that gives us determinism. Yay. Well, does it? Uh, I mentioned that it uh, ensures determinism, but the, the word that we use there, I have to be somewhat careful about it, because a CNC is a C++ library, and it can't guarantee determinism per se. Rather, in collaboration with the user, it can help make determinism achievable. Uh, so there are still quite a few properties that the programmer has to remember, to uh, rules that the programmer has to remember to follow, promises that the programmer has to keep. So of course, the uh, library API for programming this is very similar to other task parallel frameworks, where we're going to implement some kind of uh, class or struct that exposes an execute method, and that's the behavior of the task, the execute method. And then we form these step collections, and we assemble them into some graph of tables and step collections, and then we execute that graph in parallel until it reaches quiescence and is finished executing. Um, so that's all well and good, but from the Haskell perspective, we would say that an, inv an invocation of the execute function on a given tag in a, in a given graph context uh, is an I.O. action. That means it can do anything. Uh, it can um, print to the screen, it can grab a lock. And the other companies we, and users that we were working with using the Intel CNC library, they very often did what we called cheating. They would simply communicate outside of the API, and as soon as you do that, you lose some of the guarantees that we were trying to provide about deadlock freedom, about determinism, and so on. 
So that made me interested in what we could do with languages where we could actually lock down some of those side effects, where we could design a parallel programming library like Intel Concurrent Collections. But instead of the type of every task being I.O., being an unrestricted anything goes type action, instead maybe we could invent some custom application specific type, say the CNC monad, uh, where you're only allowed to execute the kinds of actions that we want you to be able to execute to maintain the invariance of the library as a whole. So you can only execute puts and gets. The tasks are still imperative, but those are the only imperative actions that they can take. Uh, you can't grab any locks, you can't print to the screen, you can't launch the missiles. So that's the idea, one of the other big ideas in Haskell, is it's not just that it comes with this baked in IO monad, but you can also design your own monads. Sometimes monads are called the computational glue, and you can parameterize that yourself. Sometimes it's called the programmable semicolon. The semicolon that separates individual statements is uh, is essentially a not with a fixed meaning. We can give it a different meaning by, uh, by introducing a new type of computation. And uh, I'll give you one more example of an application-specific monad. So this is the Haxel monad that's been developed at Facebook. So the idea here is that Facebook backend code, it needs to read from a variety of different data sources to say grab your list of friends and somebody else's list of friends and perform operations on them. Um, so Facebook had developed a custom language for writing little scripts that would express all these data fetches and processing of those data, fetch, data fetches, and it would run in an interpreter. Uh, and the reason for that special language was because there had to be special support for batching and caching these I.O. requests to the back end. Uh, so what they did at Facebook was they replaced that custom language with one of these custom computation types inside Haskell. So then you can use all of the normal parts of the Haskell ecosystem, Haskell libraries, Haskell compiler, and get relatively good performance from the compiled code. But you could also design this custom computation type called Haxel that represents the kind of data fetches and data optimizations you want to do. So it looks just as though we're running code in the IO monad. I want to say fetch the friends of x, fetch the friends of y, and return to me the length of the intersection of those two sets of friends. So maybe you have three friends in common, maybe you have five, just an integer. So the type is Haxel of int. Now, if this were the IO monad, then these two uh, actions would happen strictly in sequence. The IO monad is the, so the source of strict sequencing in Haskell programs. It tells us what has to happen uh, in strict linear order. Everything else, the compiler can reorder, rewrite, eliminate, substitute. Uh, the Haskell monad does not have the kind of strict ordering requirements. It's actually an applicative, uh, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, and so in the Haskell monad, it gathers together in a breadth-first way all of the data requests that you make, and then batches them into one fetch request on the backend data service and implements caching. So of course, there will be multiple rounds of requests because you can have some data dependencies where you have to wait for the first round of requests to return before you can make the next round of requests to the backend. Um, but all of that is transparent to the user. You just write code like this, and that concurrency and that batching is implicit, an implicit uh, property of this computation. OK. So please stop me if you have any questions or if anything is unclear at all. We've talked a little bit about the IO monad and what, what it allows you to do. Basically everything you would do in most imperative languages. It's a little mini imperative language. Um, but there's also other monads that come built in with Haskell. Not just application specific ones, but also generally useful monads. Such as the ST monad, which is used for thread local mutable state. For mutable state that never escapes the thread, is never concurrently accessed and is uh, very restrictive in its use. There's another monad called STM for software transactional memory, uh, where we're running transactions and even nested transactions against uh, transactional variables. So how do we ultimately use these kinds of monads that are not I.O.? If the main function is I.O., and we can run I.O., and we can run pure computation, how do we run these other monads? Well, uh, a monad like ST is what I call a dischargeable monad, where unlike the I.O. monad, you can actually get out of it. That is to say, I can take an ST computation and return to you a result that has no ST in it whatsoever. So for example, if I want to create a vector, an unbox vector, and I want to do an in-place sort of that vector in the same way as I would in any traditional imperative language, uh, I can run that and I can hide it inside of a pure function so that nobody on the outside, including the compiler, which is doing reordering optimizations and so on, needs to know that there's anything imperative happening. Because strict thread local state is effectively indistinguishable from purely functional code in that it's deterministic and the outcome is always a function of the inputs. Uh, so what does this look like? Well, we can have a sort function that's directly written as an imperative in-place quicksort, let's say. And it takes an ST vector of integers 
Now there's this funny S parameter that I've highlighted. So that plays a similar role to the ownership system in Rust, where it identifies this region in which, essentially a thread or a region, in which this state can be modified. And outside of that, it can't be modified. So this says, give me an ST vector residing in region S, and I will perform an ST computation for its side effect only. I return void, uh, but it will have the effect of sorting that vector in place. And then how we use this inside and hide it behind a purely functional interface would be we, lit, uh, we um, define a sort function that just takes an immutable vector and returns a new immutable vector. It has no monads. It has no side effects. You can see right from its type signature. And we simply define sort as the run st uh, by composing uh, sort prime with run st. Now, run st has this kind of advanced trick that's actually been around for a long time, since around 1994, of using this um, X, uh, universal quantifier from logic, this for all s in its input. So that's just a scoping trick. So that's how it enforces that nothing from this local computation escapes inside that t variable. So this is a polymorphic type signature that it implicitly says, for all t, for all s, I take st, st, and I return t. And uh, the idea here is if t contained an, another st vector that mentioned s, well, we don't want some other thread to get that and start mutating what was supposed to be our thread local variable. So that for all quantifier is a way of guaranteeing that anybody who tries to smuggle out a mutable state that's associated with this region inside that t type is going to get a type error because that uh, s parameter will try to escape its scope. OK, so STM is a little bit of a simpler story. Uh, STM, software transactional memory, is, of course, non-deterministic, even though it's data race free in, the, uh, in that you don't have to worry about the traditional memory model issues. Uh, but it's ultimately going to run not inside pure code, but inside I.O. code. So you can run an atomic transaction, an entire atomic transaction, as a single I.O. action just by calling this atomically function, which basically casts an STM to an I.O. so that you can use it inside your main function. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize today is that not only do we divide our code up into these different regimes that use different side effects with different pros and cons and different rules, uh, but we're also implicitly dividing up our heap in that while we're running uh, the program, we've got some objects within the heap that are part of this conceptual uh, set of immutable data. I'm not trying to imply that we physically partition the heap to keep immutable data separate from mutable data. We don't do that in the GHC Haskell implementation. But we do conceptually have a subset of the heap that's immutable data, a subset of the heap that's thread local immutable data, a subset of the heap that's transactional variables and transactional data, and finally, a subset of the heap that's traditional global shared state that's mutated by anyone, anywhere, by any thread. Um, so what I want to show you today is that there are some empirical quantitative benefits that we can get from reducing the percentage that is global shared mutable state. And while we could write Haskell programs that are just kind of direct port of an imperative program where every data structure is mutable and 100% of the heap consists of mutable data, they're very rare in practice. So that can uh, allow us to do some different, uh, some different implementation strategies. Just to give you a sense of the code that goes along with this, if I want to create a mutable reference, a single variable, mutable reference, that lives inside the IO portion of the heap, I would run this code. So this says, uh, create a new IO ref. The data type is called IO ref. Uh, and then I'm going to write three to it. And finally, I'll read back the three that I just wrote. So pointless code, but just to demonstrate the API. There's an analogous API for ST. If I want to run a thread create a thread local reference, I say new ST ref instead of new IO ref. Now, actually, using type classes, there are some polymorphic APIs that would let you, say, write your quick sort function as a piece of imperative code that would work both for ST and for IO, because you don't want to write the code twice. But that's, that's a little complicated. OK, so that's how we write code that generates uh, mutable heap variables in these two different subsets of the heap. And one example of how we take advantage of this is this year we published a paper where we explored this question of what if Haskell simply used sequential consistency as its memory model, rather than exposing the weak memory model of the architecture. So this is something that a number of researchers have tried for a number of languages. But in Haskell, we benefit from the quantitative fact that this kinds of state that can be accessed by multiple threads is quantitatively rare. Uh, so the empirical result that we get is that enforcing sequential consistency only gives us a 0.4% overhead on the uh, 1,200 benchmarks that we ran it on. And there, we sort of harvested code from this online package set so that we could find a variety of different programs and benchmark sets to 
to run this experiment on. We also surveyed the 17 million lines of code that were on Hackage uh, at the time to figure out statically what percentage of modules were actually using these things like write IO ref, where you potentially could have a data race. Uh, and only 1.73% of all modules of 102,000 modules we looked at uh, had any instruction whatsoever like a write IO ref, which could potentially be racy. And if you looked at that from the perspective of percentage of lines of code, it was 0.03% of the lines of code consisted of something like write out IRF or write to a vector location. Um, so relatively little of the applications actually consist of this. It's sort of a sprinkling of global mutable shared state inside an otherwise, um, otherwise functional program or a program that uses transactional or thread local state. Uh, so the upshot here was that we could enforce sequential consistency without doing any heroic program analyses. Uh, rather, what we did was we simply attached a fence to every single write IRF, but because they're used so infrequently, we only got the overhead that you see here. Uh, conversely, a lot of the research projects that have tried to use sequential consistency as an alternative memory model for Java or for C++ have not been able to get below 50% overhead of execution. So this was an interesting result. I want to zoom in a little bit, because another thing that we talked about in that paper was even within this small set of state that we have that exists in this global shared state, we can actually car start to carve out pieces of it to shrink that subset even further. So there are some pieces of the global state that are actually protected by locks. And we can effectively do the same thing that Rust does and treat those as thread local state. It's just that the thread that owns them at any given time depends on who grabs the lock. So what does that actually look like in Haskell code? Well, rather than having an IOREF int, which says any thread can write me and you can have a data race, instead, we're going to store an stref int with that s parameter, just like before. And with it, we're going to store a lock. But the lock is decorated by the same s parameter as the stref. So here we can, uh, if we like, we can package this underneath an existential, existentially bound type variable for this s. But that's an esoteric technical point. But the bottom line is that when we want to write this stref, we have to call a function like this, with lock. So while holding this lock, uh, run this st action. So it can do anything it wants. It can read that int, it can write that int, because the st action we pass in as the second argument of with lock takes that same s parameter that decorates the st ref. So that gives it permission to do mutations inside that region of heap objects. Um, so this with lock function implicitly releases the lock when it's done, and if we have a number of different threads calling with lock, they each take turns modifying this piece of state protected by the lock, of course. But the end result has to be an IO, because just like with software transactional memory, this process of grabbing locks is itself non-deterministic. So ultimately, we have to be in the IO monad if we want to be non-deterministic. Any questions yet? Yeah? Uh, going back to just the previous slide. Sure. Mm -hmm. How do I feed that later? How do I take the lock again? How do I know what S passed in? I don't understand how it's used. Yeah, so it probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to try to dynamically write code here. But a very simple example code, if we can imagine it, would say uh, with lock L, uh, I'm going to pass in an uh, ST ref that, uh, or sorry, pass in an ST action like write IO ref 3, or sorry, write ST ref 3. And then I can do the same thing on the next line of code with lock L write stref4. And as long as we sort of do a pattern match on a data structure to get out both the lock and the stref at the same time, we can say with lock, write us, with lock l, write strefr for the lock and the reference. So we can kind of go into this as many times as we want and do as many transactions as we want. So a here is an action which we might call lambda. Ah, I'm glad you asked this question. So a, we usually had that void value before here. But this is not the action. This is rather the return value of the action. So before, when we said IO int, we were saying run some IO, and then we get an int back. And this is simply saying, we could actually do without this if you only wanted to do side effects. But let's say you wanted to grab the lock, read the int reference, and then return the int. How would you do that? Well, I would say with lock, read stref r. And then the a would be int in that case. And the, int, the type of that whole with lock expression there's really no statements in Haskell. Everything's an expression. The type of that with lock expression would be IO of int. 
And so in my main function, I could run that whole with lock expression and get the int, uh, the int back from the IO transaction. And so the A is the return value. Does that help at all? Okay. Well, I guess the, the action is the whole SD thing. Yeah, maybe uh, some parentheses would help here. So this is an action describing a thread local imperative action. And then this is the return value, which is a global I.O. action, which is more unrestricted. So this looks a little bit like one of those casts where we cast STM to I.O. for the purpose of executing it as part of the main thread. But it has the extra caveat that it grabs a lock and releases a lock. And of course, it's exception safe. If you divide by zero in the middle of this, it has to release the lock and so on. So it's the kind of uh, usual scoping benefits. OK. So the kinds of safety properties that we've talked about so far, we talked about how do you enforce sequential consistency for this hybrid imperative functional language? Uh, how do you enforce race freedom, determinism, as in Intel concurrent collections? How do you even enforce memory safety uh, so that the program won't seg fault? Uh, so all of these things, the, the way that we talk about these things, uh, I'm sometimes dissatisfied with, because we throw around words like guarantee. But we really need to be quite precise about which code is trusted and which code isn't. This discussion came up yesterday with the Rust unsafe blocks. The question is kind of within an organization or within a library and the client of the library, who needs to write the unsafe blocks and which code do we have to trust? So all languages that I'm aware of include some kind of cheats and backdoors. There's always foreign function interfaces. There's always the Java unsafe API, the Rust unsafe block, and Haskell is no exception. It has some of those same unsafe backdoors. So what I really like to have is a compiler switch so that we can say that a given compilation unit either is allowed to or is not allowed to have these kinds of backdoors in it. So to sort of establish explicitly in a compiler checked way what the trusted code boundaries are when we're building our safe abstractions out of unsafe building blocks. So what this looks like in Haskell is we have a system called Safe Haskell, which is essentially a subset of the language that's compiler enforced. Uh, so every module in Haskell is categorized in three different categories. It's either safe, which should be called inferred safe. This means the compiler can verify that nothing naughty is going on uh, without trusting the user, trusting the programmer at all. Uh, there's unsafe, which means the compiler has inferred that there's definitely naughty stuff happening, uh, like these backdoors or foreign function code uh, or what have you. Um, and then there's trustworthy code, which is uh, similar to what we were talking about yesterday with Rust's split at mute method. Uh, that's where we trust the author of the package. We trust the package. It's on our white list of trusted packages. And we believe, for the, in the standard library, for, for example, we believe that the module exports a safe interface, even though it internally uses unsafe features. Data structure implementations are a common example of this. I want, might want to drop below my memory model and use some racy operations to implement a concurrent lock-free data structure, but then I want to give it some external interface that says, OK, it preserves sequential consistency or it preserves whatever property you're looking for. But at the current stage, this is still a process of human uh, validation, where the, it's the human's responsibility to check and ensure that trustworthiness, uh, not proved by, a, say, a mechanized proof system. OK, so uh, talking about those safety guarantees and about using safe Haskell as a way to get more serious about identifying our trusted code boundaries, the next topic I'd like to touch on is scaling up a little bit. So let's go from safety guarantees like race freedom on the memory of the process to instead look at end-to-end -end guarantees for an entire process or an entire subtree of processes and all of their input-output operations. How can we get system-level deterministic data processing and system-level deterministic parallelism out of our programs? So you can do this with any language, but um, because runtime determinism enforcement is sort of a well-studied pro uh, problem, and we can even take arbitrary x86 binaries and run them in a deterministic mode. But some language support can help quite a bit. So one thing we're experimenting with in Haskell right now is changing the type of the main function. So main for 27, well, for 20-some years has been of type IO. But if we instead have a main function of type det IO, we can design a custom monad who's, uh, that's a little less expressive than IO. It still allows you to write to files. It still allows you to print to the screen. But it has a restricted set of effects in order to guarantee determinism. And the end result is that a program whose main type is dead.io should be basically the entire program execution could be viewed as a deterministic function from input files to output files. We're targeting batch processing workloads. So if you try to do networking system calls, the execution will just fail. Uh, but for things like compilers, 
or scientific data processing, like bioinformatics, where we take an input data set to an output data set. We can view that entire process as a pure function from the bits of the input to the bits of the output, down to the last bit and byte. OK, so uh, one way that we want to do this is we want to write hybrid deterministic parallel shell scripts, which have a statically typed component where all the parallelism lives. And then they can also shell out to external processes, which are run in a kind of dynamic encapsulation mode to ensure that they're deterministic. So a simple example would be if we want to compile every file in the current directory, uh, and we want to do it by calling out to gcc-c, we want the whole result of this main function to be deterministic. How do we do it? Well, we're, uh, we're experts in deterministic parallel language design, and we're working with some experts in deterministic runtime enforcement at UPenn, namely my collaborator, Joe Devietti. And we have a paper and submission on this topic where we enable this kind of program. And the GCC example isn't entirely, isn't entirely made up. We actually uh, do have a GCC repl uh, a make replacement. Uh, but the basic idea here is that the statically checked part of the program is the part where the type system is ensuring determinism, whereas the dynamic part where we call out to arbitrary x86 binaries, we're only supporting x86 at the moment, unfortunately, that dynamically enforced part uh, requires a runtime system. It re requires that we use ptrace or LD preload or in some way modify the runtime. And uh, what we've implemented is a drop-in replacement for GNU make, and we call it det make, and debt makes main function is, in fact, just a dead I.O. function. Uh, so everything that it does with reading files off the disk, with determining dependencies, with executing jobs in parallel from make-j is all done in this debt I.O. monad. And one of the things I really like about it is that um, I always have a little uncertainty when I'm running make-j. And one of the things I love about debt make is that even the shell output is deterministic. So every time you run it, you will see the same shell output, even though it's actually executing in parallel. And it will always give you the same result, so you never have to be shy about using dash j. As a minor thing, we actually made dash j the default, so that's a little bit of a um, divergence from GNU make. Uh, what I was showing a moment ago was actually a little bit of pseudocode. So the actual Haskell code for this, whenever we do an iterator uh, or a loop, we actually pass in a lambda function. So this says, for each dir, call this lambda function on each file. And if you ask, what is the type of the result of that lambda function? Well, of course, it's dead IO. It's a monadic action. Now, like I said, right now with our current prototype, we're doing all the parallelism up here. So the Haskell program can be parallel. The Haskell program can do whatever it wants in terms of parallel programming, task parallelism, data parallelism, as long as we can certify that it's deterministic for the purpose of supporting this end-to-end -end deterministic workflow. Now, currently in our current prototype, the x86 binaries, the arbitrary binaries that we call out to, we actually sequentialize them. Th that can be changed in the future, but it's a lot easier for us to guarantee sequential execution for one of these binaries, like GCC, if we execute it sequentially. So we do the outer loop, the parallelism, in our kind of parallel coordinator or parallel shell script up here. And then the inner loop is calls to GCC or a bio existing bioinformatics program, and so on. So that's the way that we write deterministic parallel shell scripts. That's right, yeah, when you get to uh, thread switch locations. In our case, we actually sequentialize the program right now. So when you call pthread create, the child thread runs before the parent resumes. Uh, but that's just our current prototype. We're going to replace that with a deterministic concurrency mechanism. So right now, we can essentially only run things that don't have true con concurrency, which is more programs than I might have initially thought. And, oh. and if you do that, you find that GCC is deterministic? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Absolutely, and so are all the bioinformatics applications we looked at. Um, now, creating sort of 100% encapsulation, even for adversarial programs, is a little bit of an open research challenge. So our current prototype um, it will not work for adversarial programs. For, for instance, we intercept libc calls. If you have statically linked uh, direct system call instructions, we're not intercepting those right now. Uh, and we're, we're moving towards using a hypervisor so that we can virtualize and intercept everything that we need. But our current prototype is just a little LD preload shim that modifies the behavior of the program in that way by intercepting libc. But also, I mean, I would think in your definition, any C++ program is potentially malicious in that it could have a buffer overflow that needs uninitialized memory and try to do some Oh, oh, wait, but uh, this is a uh, separate process. Oh, I'm sorry, are you talking about address space randomization and other? We turn off ASLR, I should mention. 
on Linux, MMAP is pretty deterministic when you turn off ASLR. So we're in large part relying on operating system abstractions here instead of on programming language abstractions to get this determinism. Um, but yeah, ultimately we need to take care of those things. For, uh, for purposes of the, the recording, can you get a question from the audience can you repeat? Oh, thank you. The question from the audience was, could you please repeat the questions from the audience? <laughs> um, yes, I will remember to do that. Uh, all right, so we haven't done it yet, but one fun thing I think about this, this sort of view, from my view, deter, uh, p imperative programs, functional programs, these are just sort of programming style issues. And the main thing that really matters is determinism versus non-determinism. That's my particular perspective. So from my perspective, an arbitrary entire C++ program running sequentially should be viewable in Haskell as a pure function. It's a pure function from the standard input. Let's rule out I.O. for the moment to the disk. And let's say that it's a pure function from the standard input that that process takes to the standard output that that process produces. So it shouldn't even need to have an I.O. type. We should be able to call a foreign binary that is a byte stream to byte stream function. That's kind of an extreme example of the run ST principle. You can do something imperative in a way that's encapsulated and safe, and then you can squint and look at the whole thing as though it's purely functional and maintains all of the mathematical properties in terms of reordering and uh, common sub-expression elimination and so on that you want it to have. Okay, so if there, unless there are any more questions on, on that, I want to tell you a little bit more about the kinds of parallel programming we actually can do on the Haskell side. So what kind of parallelism is available to us before we shell out to those arbitrary binaries or in the, that coordinator example? Uh, so one basic principle for designing deterministic parallel programming languages or parallel programming libraries is the principle of non-interference. This is a very simple idea that if two different tasks or computations uh, never write the same memory address, then of course their results are not going to depend on, on one another and there's not going to be any kind of data race. There are different ways of actually getting to non-interference. For purely functional code, well, you always get non-interference by default uh, without sweating because two calls to different functions in parallel are always computed only for their end results and in a kind of futures programming model, those end results are never used until after some join synchronization point. So you can't really observe which one completed first and so on. Other sort of leaks of non-deterministic non bits from the underlying runtime system, say a work-stealing runtime system, such as in Haskell. So in Haskell code, we have these kinds of futures everywhere. Uh, basically, every computation is a potential future. But just like in Silk, you have to say spawn if you want to actually give the compiler a hint that it should take advantage of parallelism there. And that has nothing to do with monads. You can run this kind of purely functional parallelism anywhere you want, and it has a, uh, a work-stealing runtime system that has about the same overhead as a single silk spawn per uh, spawned parallel computation. All right, the imperative flavor of non-interference is a little harder to achieve. So the idea is similar, that you simply want the two computations to write to disjoint parts of the heap. And then you want to be able to argue that because they don't touch the same addresses, they can't data race, and the end result is deterministic. Uh, so there are a variety of approaches for this. There are new uh, type systems for Java, such as deterministic parallel Java. There's Rust's approach, although Rust usually aims for data race freedom, not for the stronger deterministic parallelism property. Uh, we have our own take on how to do this in the Haskell context in our PLDI 14 paper. And just as Nico described yesterday, the key problem is avoiding aliasing that leads to data races and potential non-determinism. Why is this hard? Well, of course, almost every programming language that has threads has the combination of these two features. The writes to memory at addresses that are not statically knowable to computed offsets, computed addresses, together with the ability to fork threads. Those two things give you the potential for data races. So raw might writes to anywhere in the heap are a very powerful and very flexible feature, but also one that makes it easy to cut yourself in terms of data races and non-determinism. So what we're looking for in this research is some kind of safe by construction tool that can get the same job done, but with which we can't hurt ourselves, even if we try. And the basic idea that we have is not to use a program analysis approach to analyze alias freedom, but instead to construct an API where we can preserve alias freedom inside the mutable data structures that we're operating on in parallel. So this is what we do in our PLDI 14 paper, and the basic idea is that we keep the state at a remove from the programmer, and we use a restricted API, kind of a grammar of known safe, known alias freedom preserving operations. These are things like the split at mute, where we've sort of certified as a trusted developer that we 
we know this is going to retain alias freedom, so we mark it as a safe thing that we can do to the mutable state. And those are the only things that we can do to, to transform the mutable state in ways that could introduce aliases, but we guarantee they don't. So we develop a grammar of alias freedom preserving actions. I'll give you, I'll give you a small sampling of the kind of, things, kind of actions that exist in that grammar. So it's always safe to create new storage. If I want to create a new array with seven elements, then that is going to be disjoint from every other piece of memory in the system because I just allocated it. If I take an existing piece of memory and I do a deep copy on it, well, of course, the result, the tuple of these two arrays, doesn't have any internal aliasing because these two halves of the array are, uh, the second half of the array is a fresh copy and it can't alias with the first. Likewise, we can do splitting. This is that split at mute function. We can identify a, play, uh, a given index and then split the arrays in half. In this case, we split both arrays in half and we take both the first parts and both the second parts together. This is what we use inside an implementation of an in-place parallel merge sort, for example, where we have um, two buffers and we want to split them both. I want to show you how this actually works in code. And compared to some of our previous code, you'll see I took away the, uh, the curly braces and the semicolons. They're optional, but it's also a layout-sensitive language like Python, so you can omit them if you like. So in this do block, we're going to compose some monadic actions. And the first one is going to simply allocate an array, like we mentioned on the previous slide. Now, one thing that's interesting here is you'll notice we don't bind the resulting array to a variable. So where'd it go? This is a state monad that implicitly keeps that array as the kind of thread local state within this computation. So you don't necessarily have to have a variable bound to it at any given point in time. It's still there. Now, in this region of code, directly after allocating the array, we can now modify any part of it that we like. Uh, so, for example, we can grab a pointer to the array even. We ask, we call ask to ask the monad to reify a pointer to its implicit state. This is the entire vector. And then we can run arbitrary code. In this case, this is ST code that's going to fill the vector with ones, and we filled the entire vector. Uh, and we don't have to worry about data races because we're the sole owner of the entire array. Now, when we get to a fork join construct like this, now we're partitioning up the array. We're telling the system split the array at uh, after the first three locations, and the left child will have access to the left region, the right child will have access to the right region. Now, if these tasks down here tried to access the v1 variable, you'll notice the v1 variable is actually in scope in terms of lexical scope here, but if we try to access it, we'll get a type error because that magic s parameter that provides the identity of the session has changed. So we'll get an error if we try to access anything from the parent region inside the child region directly. Instead, what these child computations do is they ask for their own pointers to their slice of the array, and then they can call fill without racing with each other, filling in the left and right half of the arrays separately. Any questions about that? This is a more restrictive model than the Rust model, but it's a way of getting at the same thing. And for certain algorithms where there's only a small number of large core mutable data structures, it's not too much of an ergonomic challenge to deal with the state as this single implicit object that we manipulate, rather than having an arbitrary number of different variables bound to different pieces of state. Um, and it's a way that we can use the existing Haskell type system to encode this kind of parallel computation that still never escapes a thread and is still deterministic overall. And while Rust can do a similar thing, we are able to guarantee not just race freedom, but also determinism in this example. And as far as I know, this was the first example of an in-place parallel sorting function even though in-place sequential sorts have been around since 1994, this was the first example of an in-place parallel sorting function that's hidden inside a pure function using only safe mechanisms. So to write the sort itself, we don't have any unsafe code anywhere. The code doesn't need to be trusted vis-a-vis -vis these guarantees. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about how we're expanding this notion of these separate kingdoms of the heap. So we've now introduced this new idea where some of the ST state is actually used by multiple threads but it's in this disjoint way that keeps it all safe and present, prevents races and even prevents non-determinism. So this kind of expands our picture, but there's one way that we can expand our picture further. And this is the last parallel programming mechanism that I'm gonna talk about today. Basically, we can introduce a new category of state, which I call monotonic state. So this is uh, another kind of state, kind of like STM, if you will, where it's only accessed by certain restricted operations in the system. It is mutable, but it's only in a, mutable in a way that changes monotonically. So think about reductions with uh, counter variables that only increase or with sets that only grow with insert operations, uh, at least during the parallel region. After the parallel region, they can shrink if you'd like, but during the parallel region, they don't. 
So here we extend our notion of non-interference. We instead want interference. We want constructive interference through these monotonic mutable objects that are, that are shared between multiple threads. So two threads asynchronously, in whatever order they like, can write different, uh, different values to this summation reduction variable. And its state at any given point in time, you're not allowed to read it, because its, its state at this moment, at time t, will be non-deterministic. Uh, but its final state will be a deterministic outcome of the total set of things that were written to it during the parallel region. So in some of our work in Popple 2014, we took this idea even further. We generalized the notion of traditional reductions, which every parallel programming framework has to include, uh, to something that we call LVARs, or lattice variables. So these are basically any data structure whose abstract states we can model as a semi-joint lattice, and whose state during the parallel re regions only increases in that semi-joint lattice towards some top, although typically we interpret top as error. So this is our abstract model, and we have a library called Elvish for programming with LVARs that uh, implements this model. But it's important to remember that uh, these, these uh, lattices are not represented at runtime. These are just the mathematical model behind these data structures. The Elvish library uses traditional lock-free, compare-and-swap-based data structures to implement these kind of concurrency abstractions. And the number of operations that you can perform on LVARs while retaining this determinism guarantee is somewhat surprising. Sure, you have commuting inserts. An insert into a map commutes with another insert into a map. But you also have blocking reads, just like I mentioned with concurrent collections, where you wait for data to become available and then you run, like with a future. You have a freeze operation. Even during the concurrent execution, you can freeze data structures after which they cannot move up in the lattice any further, but you can then execute traversal or iteration operations over them in addition to these blocking reads. And uh, altogether, it adds up to a pretty interesting programming model that kind of pushes the boundaries of what we can do with deterministic parallel programming. All right, so unless there are any questions on that, I'm going to move into the last segment of this talk. I will make one more comment here, which is uh, I'll mention formal verification a little bit at the end. So one place where I think Haskell libraries provide a good opportunity for lightweight formal verification is in these kinds of deterministic parallel programming libraries. If you simply look at the reduction operators that are provided by different libraries and languages, some of them, like Intel Array Building Blocks, they provide only a fixed set of reductions. They'll say, you can reduce with plus, you can reduce with times, you can reduce with XOR. By limiting the number of reduction operations, they can guarantee that they're all associative and commutative. But most uh, parallel programming libraries that I'm familiar with, even the ones that claim to be deterministic, such as Elvish or deterministic parallel Java, at least in the past, they have typically left some of these burden of proof on the end user. If you pass in a function to the reduction, the library is just going to assume that it's actually associative. It's your job to make sure it's associative. But in a strict new version of the Elvish library, we're experimenting with the idea of requiring a proof of associativity if you want to use the reduction function that actually assumes associativity. Otherwise, you have to use a different reduction function. It has somewhat more runtime overhead, but it uses a fixed topology. So it doesn't need to assume associativity for a deterministic outcome. So that's one fun place where we're not doing heroic whole program verification, but formally verifying little bits and pieces. This function's associative, this function's commutative, can help our libraries maintain their invariance uh, in a very rigorous way. All right, in the last section here, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about performance and data representation. So Haskell is a statically typed language. Uh, it has pretty good performance, uh, often on par with Java, rarely on par with C++ for well-optimized benchmarks. Um, it has some performance problems as well that we, that we still need to work on. There are plenty of ways to make your programming language extremely slow, and we've seen, we've seen many of these in action. Uh, you can have a really Byzantine called dispatch semantics, where you have to check a million different places before you can just call a function. Uh, you can have inefficient data representations. And this one I find is really popular. Lots of languages box the heck out of everything. You have to follow 10 pointers to get to anything. Um, so we avoid some of the obvious pitfalls with Haskell, but we have a few unique pitfalls of our own. Uh, so here's some pros and cons of data in Haskell. And I feel like data in Haskell is often misunderstood. Even by programming language practitioners, some people think Haskell is only a lazy language, for example, when actually Haskell has pretty good support for strict data types, which often enable better data representations. Because after all, a lazy value is basically some kind of closure or a lambda that you have to execute later, which is always going to have some overhead. 
OK, so what are some of the pros for data representation? Well, we can unbox primitive types and records. We, don't, we haven't gone so wild with boxing, like some languages, that even ints and doubles get boxed. Plain old data is unboxed within data records. We can even unbox records and records. And a lot of high-level garbage collected languages don't do this. C Sharp has value types. Most functional languages don't. So if I have a record containing another record, ah, that's a pointer. That's an object. Um, with Haskell, I can have a record containing another record, and it's just one heap object. Uh, from the perspective of the garbage collector and the allocator. Uh, we have vectors with unboxed elements. Uh, we have a little bit more than that. Our standard vector libraries do automatic array of struct, destructive array representation transformations. So if you're computing over an, a, a three-dimensional array of double-double-double uh, tuples, then that's going to have a good heap representation. It's going to be only three heap objects for your different, um, for your x, y, and z components in that case. Uh, so that's all very nice. Um, we have a full set of numeric types, and I find that helps with a lot of uh, low-level bit twiddling stuff. So we don't only have int32 and int64, but we've got int16 and int8, and we can do unaligned pointer operations within raw buffers of bytes. That's one that I find that a lot of compilers don't have the primops for. So if I want to read a word at an unaligned offset within a buffer, sometimes that's either slow or there's no compiler operation for it. We have a lot of those basic pieces. We actually also have SIMD operations supported by the compiler. So some of the basic bits and pieces are there. Um, there's a lot of really interesting high-level optimizations in Haskell. So that's what Haskell is really fun about Haskell, but sometimes really frustrating for the programmer, is that Haskell is a radical compiler that tries to transform your program in radical ways. If you write your program as some map, map, fold series of traversals, that thing can often fuse down to one loop. Uh, and whether or not it does depends on a complex system of optimization rules where you're taking advantage of this purely functional nature of the program to rewrite it aggressively, much like SQL query optimizers aggressively rewrite their query plans. Um, so that's great. It's called deforestation when we can eliminate temporary data structures. You have a list or a map that's in the program but doesn't actually exist at runtime. So when we can accomplish that, it's good. But unpredictability and when we accomplish it is bad. So that's the unpredictable deforestation down here. And if we're not a performance-oriented programmer, we can very often end up with excessive laziness, which can really slow down our program. So Haskell makes it very easy for beginner and intermediate programs, programmers to write very slow programs. But it also makes it possible uh, to write faster programs when you start to learn the system a little better. There are some things that you can't really get around, because Haskell today is synonymous with GHC. So GHC has a large runtime system. Uh, it's not a real tight uh, language implementation that you would want to embed in other programs unless you're willing to have larger binaries. Uh, it has a not so scalable GC. So while it does have parallel GC, it doesn't have concurrent GC. So it doesn't have a garbage collector that's competitive with the best garbage, uh, Java garbage collectors, for instance. And as a result, Haskell is good at parallelism on today's laptops and desktops, but it's not really scalable to the point of the largest SMP servers with uh, 64 or 72 big cores. Now, I mentioned a number of data representation advantages, and I want to talk about one cool data representation thing that I feel is common to the, to the C++ community and Haskell community, but very rare in other communities, uh, which is this notion of data baking. This is a term that I've heard in game programming concepts, uh, contexts, and I don't think it's that widely used, but it is, it's this idea that you use the external representation for your data also as the internal representation in memory. Obviously, that's a big trade-off, because you lose portability, you want to treat this data just as a transient cached thing when you're doing this, not as some persistent durable representation to store for the ages. Um, but when you can do it, it means deserialization and serialization are non-existent. And for a game that does data baking, for instance, if your assets are represented in this way, then loading the assets becomes just mmapping them and demand paging them off the disk. So that's fabulous for performance, uh, if you're on a platform with virtual memory, of course. Uh, so this is a great trick. Uh, very few languages do it. There's the abomination package in Rust. Uh, Haskell, <laughs> great name. It's actually misspelled as part of its theme of abomination. Uh, so if you search for it, keep that in mind. Uh, so uh, Haskell, as of GHC 8.2, uh, this has been merged into mainline. And even though it's not released yet, it's actually already in use in, at Facebook uh, by that same group that I mentioned before. Um, so the idea with Haskell is a little different than in C++ because we have the garbage collector to worry about, right? So an immutable value in Haskell in general is some subgraph of the heap. Uh, if it's immutable, we know that that graph's not going to change. So the connectivity of that graph won't change. So that gives us a little bit of a leg up in making it easier to coalesce those values, either during garbage collection or just by doing an explicit copy. If we coalesce those values into their own page, let's say, into their own disjoint region of memory, 
Well, now we know that even though this thing is a tree or a graph, even though it's some arbitrary pointer graph with an arbitrary number of heap objects, we basically can treat it as one super heap object. So this is great for amortizing the cost of garbage collection. Uh, this means that we no longer need to uh, we no longer need to traverse those objects that are inside the compact region. Whenever the garbage collector gets to that thing, it just stops because it knows that there's a transitive closure property, that everything inside the region only points to other things in the region. You're not allowed to point out of the region. That's the critical invariant that we retain. But because this fits well with the block structured heap implementation that GHC already uses, uh, and it unifies the internal and the external representation when we're doing uh, communication, either with disk or over the network. There are no type system requirements in the sense that you can do this for any type of data. So there's not even, um, we do have a type class called compactable for the data that fits into this, but we can pretty much do it for any of the data that's, that exists on the Haskell heap. Um, so the end result of this is when we use it for communication to send these blocks of data across the network, using RDMA, we can get two to four X better performance uh, by avoiding deserialization, even though the data we send is larger than it would be in serialized form. If the network's fast enough, it's still better to skip serialization and just send the data directly in a zero copy fashion from one heap to another heap. Uh, we also compared against Java and, uh, and exceeded the performance of the Java library we compared against there for um, serialization, deserialization. We can also use it for communicating to disk. And this is something I love very much. I kind of hate parsing the same JSON or XML data multiple times. If we have a month of Twitter data on disk, it's going to take a couple gigabytes. And if I read it in once to do an analysis, the next time I read it in, I don't really want to parse the JSON representation again. Rather, what I want is a file system caching layer that has transparently cached it as a compact region file, which, of course, is specific to the compiler version and is not portable, uh, but it's a cache. And when I read from that cache compact normal form, I get two big benefits. First of all, reading, reading the data in becomes just an MMAP. And that that's, avoids a lot of overhead with doing the deserialization. But it also gives us random access. Once I MMAP a big data structure, like this Twitter data set, if I then access into the middle of it, I don't have to actually read the whole file to get there. I don't have to parse the whole JSON or XML stream to get to the middle of it. I actually just have a random access data structure in memory that's like a part of the normal heap. So I just jump to the middle, it demand pages in the piece of the middle, and then I can get about 100x faster access to the middle of the data if it's been cached in this compact form. So I want to go a lot further in that direction in the future. I love projects like Cap and Proto, for example, that try to avoid serialization and deserialization by merging internal and external representations, data baking, if you will. But I've also had a special place in my heart for many years for compilers that can change the data representation out from under the programmer without the programmer having to do anything or at least not do very much work. Uh, so one current project that we're working on that radically changes data representation. It goes a little bit beyond changing array of struct to struct of array. And instead, what it does is it rewrites the representation for entire tree data types, for what we call algebraic data types in functional languages. So these are uh, these kinds of data types here, where you've got case classes or a discriminated union or enums, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's basically a data type that takes one of several forms. In this case, a tree is either a uh, leaf node or it's an intermediate node. And this is just the simplest example that I could fit on a slide, but this is an example of an out of place tree traversal. So this you would do, for example, inside the Rust compiler when you convert the mirror intermediate representation to LVM. You are needing to do an out of place traversal because you're traversing from one type to another type. You're converting from one type to another type. Here we have a simple add one function that's just tree to tree, so it's not a different input type from the output type. But hopefully you can get the idea with this code. So to show you the kind of thing we're optimizing, uh, this is sort of the simplest example that will benefit from our compiler transforms that we're working on now. We're working in a restricted subset of Haskell, and it's actually a toy compiler at the moment. We haven't ported the optimizations into the main GHC implementation yet. But the results that we're getting right now is if you look at like this add one traversal, for example, and you apply this to a big binary tree with a million nodes or 100 million nodes, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time, first of all, you got to get the allocator right, because otherwise this, this little add one program here just becomes an allocator micro benchmark, right? So I wrote alloc up there like it's a macro. And uh, if we want to maximize the performance of the C code on the right, which implements the add one tree traversal, adding one to every leaf in the tree, the Haskell code and the C code are doing the same thing here, right? This is the same program. Uh, the syntax will vary in different languages, but it's the same program. Uh, we want to allocate the output node for the node that we're processing, and we want to either initialize it as an element, a leaf node, or, uh, or not. 
So that's why we copy over the tag. The tag field here is going to identify it as a leaf or not in this discriminated union. Um, and then we do a single branch to figure out if it's a leaf or a intermediate node, and we recursively process it. Now we can actually go even further and transform this program into a loop automatically instead of a recursive function. But that only gets us about 20%. What really gets us a lot of performance on this kind of tree traversal program is, uh, first of all, getting the allocator out of the way. So of course you want to use the thread local bump pointer arena style allocation for this allocator. That will improve your overhead by 10x on this micro benchmark instead of using the system allocator. But there's still 4x performance left on the floor. So the Intel architecture does not like this kind of pointer chasing program. So our current research project is how can we get the compiler to use a completely different data representation for this data. And the one that we use is a dense pre-order serialization of the tree. So we essentially eliminate all the pointers uh, and pack it the same way you would pack it if you're sending it over the network. And then the compiler transforms the code so that even though the programmer writes this recursive traversal here, uh, what they actually get at runtime is this tight stream processing code where you take a packed representation in a buffer and you walk over it with linear memory access patterns. So that's one of the reasons we get the 4x performance compared to GCC03 with an optimal allocator on the code on the right here. Um, so, uh, so the adaptive caching system inside Intel likes these linear access patterns very much. It can recognize it as streaming mode, and it can uh, do really well in this kind of program. So that's, uh, that's, this is still ongoing work, but that's an example of radical data structure transformation that I'm hoping we can pursue more in the future. And we have the ability to pursue it, I should say, because the data is abstract, and the compiler doesn't need to guarantee anything about the layout of the data at runtime. So we, we have some freedom to work with. We can really change the data representations and screw around with things. All right, so I thought I would wrap up today with a little bit of future directions, so future of Haskell. But do stop me if you need to. OK, so we talked about safety guarantees. And indeed, safety guarantees are a big part of the theme with Haskell. Uh, whether it's the ones I listed or it's other safety guarantees that you're interested in. Going further, programmers are interested in ensuring correctness in variance of their programs, uh, with the extreme being full formal verification uh, that an entire program meets its spec. And this is a very active research area in programming languages right now. So there are entire operating systems, entire compilers, such as CompCert, that have been formally verified end-to-end. Uh, -end. And that's a kind of Herculean effort. Uh, but there are ways that we hope that programming languages researchers like me hope that in the next 20 to 40 years, formal verification will become much more mainstream and will become a much more standard process, part of the programming process. And I believe, personally, that programs still have quite a ways to go in terms of becoming more robust and predictable. I actually had a panic this morning, because when I booted my machine from Linux to Windows, I tried to open up my presentation, and I just got this. So I think there's a way to go with correctness and making sure that programs do exactly what we want them to. OK, the traditional option for the last 10 years or so, if you're a Haskell programmer, let's say, and you want to do some verification of the correctness of your program, or you want to ensure more invariance of your program with a static type system. Well, you could verify some properties of your program using Haskell's advanced types, the kind of sexy types that go beyond what other functional languages have tr had traditionally had. So these are things like generalized algebraic data types, or GADITs. Um, and with those, you can encode invariance. For example, I can give you a red-black data, red black tree data structure definition that is constructed in such a way with a type system that you cannot construct an instance of that type that violates the red-black invariant. We just enforce it. And so we don't have to trust the programmer in that case. It's one property that we can check off of our list because it can never be violated uh, by any program. The type checker ensures it. But that doesn't go far enough. There are only certain program properties we can conveniently verify in that way using the existing Haskell type system where it stands today. Because Haskell is at this interesting junction where it's sort of one of the more radical of the practical functional languages. But it still doesn't do the same kinds of things that Agda and Koch and the dedicated theorem provers do in terms of making it easy to write proofs about programs. But we're moving there. The traditional option was if you really wanted to prove a Haskell program correct, People are kind of sloppy when they talk about this. So sometimes they talk about reasoning about functional programs, and it's not clear what that reasoning means. Does that mean sitting there with a pencil and paper and having a human do the reasoning? Or does it mean actually having a formal machine-checked uh, specification of some kind? Uh, and it has been possible, if you wanted to, to do a formal proof in Agda or Coq, one of these proof assistants, and then extract Haskell code from it, which you could link to the rest of a system and, and, and run if you like. 
but that requires jumping through a of number of hoops, and it's not the kind of thing that has really become uh, very popular. You can't find a high percentage of Hask hackage libraries on Haskell, for instance, that have been extracted or have any of their code extracted from Cock or Agda. It's just not, not that popular of an option. So Haskell is changing rapidly, and one direction we're going, we've already got this huge language with all these different features in it. So of course, as you know, that makes it a little harder to iterate and to extend to add new features. But um, Haskell has this programmer community that is trained to be used to fixing their code when a new compiler version comes out. So we keep changing the type system and iterating a little bit, even after 27 years. And right now, Haskell is actually on course to add much more radical extensions to the type system, kind of reworking the fundamental theory of Haskell and of that tight intermediate language in the middle that I mentioned, uh, to instead move towards dependent types, which are the advanced type systems that systems like Agda and Coq use to uh, kind of merge with logic and be able to represent logical formalisms directly in, uh, in the program. So programming and proving becomes sort of a single activity. There's two different visions to how this formal verification trajectory can go. You can make the Haskell type system itself super enhanced, such that you can write proofs about Haskell in Haskell, or you can do what are called refinement types. So this is like adding an extra layer of type checking on top of your existing type system. So you leave the Haskell type system alone. All programs that type check can currently continue to type check. But then you add these refinements. So instead of something of type int, you might have a type int v, where v is greater than 5. So that's a type in the refinement system. Now, the refinement system that we have today is called Liquid Haskell. And it uses an SMT solver, like many of these systems do, to discharge the proof obligations. So much of the proving process for these refinements is automatic. You don't have to write out explicit logical formalisms for the proofs because uh, the SMT solver is doing it for you. Now, in our most recent iteration of this Liquid Haskell system, uh, we're working with collaborators at UCSD, Ranjit Jala, to implement a, what we call Liquid Prover, where you can use these refinement systems to write proofs about Haskell programs, just like you would in the dependently typed world. And that's actually what we use to discharge those proof obligations about associativity of a function you're using in a parallel reduction, and so on. So this is how we're hoping we can make it more practical and a lower barrier to entry to prove certain key program invariants uh, as a normal part of the programming process. There's also other things we're working on. So we're working with Simon Payton Jones uh, and some folks at Twig.io to uh, develop a branch of Haskell that introduces linear types. So linear types, or uniqueness typing, offers the kind of benefits that Rust's ownership system has. So we've got a backwards compatible solution that adds linear types to Haskell in a way that we can now write a function uh, without garbage collection. We can write GC-free Haskell by knowing that we can free these values when they're used because they're only used once. So that, we hope, will be useful for doing a little bit lower level systems programming or more scalable programming where we want to get away from the GC. There are a lot of other improvement directions that are kind of already in progress for Haskell and will continue, I hope. Uh, we're iterating on getting better strictness support. So Haskell started off as a lazy language, and it's taken this march towards being a hybrid language that's both lazy and strict. And we hope that will continue and will be a first class great language for strict programming, as well as lazy. Those data representation advantages and disadvantages I mentioned, I would hope to continue to iterate on those and use better, better data representations for things. There are still some places where work is left to be done there. Uh, something that's landing very soon is uh, one thing we haven't had is these advanced ML style modules where you can parameterize one entire compilation unit by the signature of another compilation unit. So you could, for example, have a compilation unit that can use different string libraries and so on. Uh, there's a system called Backpack that's landing soon in Haskell for doing that. Then there are lots of other things that I would like to see worked on, but I'm not sure if we have the manpower. So in this community, as you might guess, there are a lot of people that are interested in type theory and logic. There are not a huge number of people who are also interested in compiler backends and the performance tweaking that I love. Uh, so it would be great if someone could work on a concurrent GC. It would be great if someone could work on auto vectorization. There's low hanging fruit there to be had, but right now we're a little understaffed on that end of the spectrum. Intel in 2013 actually did a really interesting piece of research from Intel Labs where they produced an alternative Haskell backend called the Intel Haskell Research Compiler, which is now open sourced. Uh, and it would take the GHC front end, but it had this really aggressive auto vectorizing, auto parallelizing back end. And they compared the performance of that against their Intel optimized Ninja code for certain benchmarks, and it performed pretty well. But most of those innovations have not been ported back into the mainline GHC compiler, and that research compiler has unfortunately become somewhat uh, rotted. It's for an older version of GHC. 
Okay, so moving forward, uh, I'm going to wrap up here so we have a little time for questions. But I think that all the things I've talked about today, especially restricting the side effects, are things that it might be hard to backport onto any existing languages. It's really one of these very uh, fundamental choices you make when you design your language, what the system of side effects will be. But some of these issues come back into play when we design embedded domain-specific languages, which I think a number of different language communities are looking at because, like Sean Parker mentioned in his 2012 talk in this same venue, a lot of the time, 99% of the performance is not accessible to regular code. If you want to use the full device, you have to have a good story for a vectorization, GPU programming, et cetera. And for example, in Haskell now, we have embedded DSLs like Accelerate that are meant to access vector units and access GPU code in a way that kind of offshores the computation from the main Haskell runtime, executing it in this DSL fashion. So whenever we design those DSLs, whether machine learning DSLs or DSLs like Halide for image processing, I would hope that we think about issues like memory models and limiting side effects and so on, and what effects those choices might have on our uh, parallelization strategies. Uh, and I will just throw in as a comment, my personal prejudice is that I think that statically typed host languages like C++ and Scala and Haskell actually have a leg up when it comes to embedding these domain-specific languages. Because you can use these overloading tricks that are captured in the type system to overload the plus operation, for instance, to operate both over deferred expressions and also over uh, native integers. Whereas the strategy that we see in the more dynamic languages often involve a kind of runtime introspection where you ask a lambda function to produce its internal AST, and you walk over it and ask yourself, can I compile this for the GPU? Um, so I, I prefer the statically typed approach for EDSLs. Wrapping up, um, C++ and Haskell, a lot of commonalities, big complicated languages, sometimes big error messages, uh, old languages that are still changing, both good for generic programming, for highly polymorphic overloaded uh, functionality in libraries. Uh, both good languages for data baking, surprisingly, or at least now they are. Uh, good host languages for EDSLs. These are some commonalities. There are still some things that I want to see Haskell steal from C++. So we have these type classes, like order, ORD for ordering, for instance, these things that are similar to concepts. Um, and those were one of the developing type classes were one of these big contributions of Haskell, as I mentioned. But the implementation strategy for type classes, if the compiler is in a non-optimizing mode, will basically pass a vtable for them, which is the opposite choice from Rust and from C++. And it's kind of unfortunate. So the compiler itself will try to optimize these vtables away. It will try to inline the dictionaries. There are even specialized pragmas that the user can uh, issue to the compiler to say, oh, this sorting function might work for any data type satisfying ORD, but I want to specialize it for int and double so that I generate a separate copy of the code that's faster if I'm sorting a vector of ints or faster if I'm sorting a vector of doubles, sort of imitating in a small way the Rust and C++ template instantiation uh, mode. Now, unfortunately, uh, those kind of template specializations, our current compiler tool chain doesn't deduplicate them. So you might have one module, it doesn't happen much in practice, but you might have one module where you specialize sort to vector int, and I have a module where I specialize sort to vector int, and then I link them and I have two copies of the code. So if we want to move forward and use this specialization machinery more aggressively, we have to do what C++ and Rust have done, and ensure that a given template specialization only has a single uh, piece of code in the, in, in the compilation result. Finally, I also personally, as a performance tuner, want more control. I want to know, I want to be able to say, okay, this thing should never be passed as a vtable. I expect the compiler to eliminate it in all cases. That's the kind of invariant I want to be able to ensure. So we have just a couple minutes to wrap up here. I'm going to leave this slide up while I thank you and ask for your questions. Uh, well, you don't actually have, it's, it's more of a compiler pragma. You say, I want this data type to be packed. So my reaction to that is that uh, there's a lot I envy about Haskell uh, as a C++ programmer, but that's like the main weakness is having to write a compiler pragma to do that rather than, I, I guess the way we would do that in C++ is, um, it's, it's also not well supported, but you would have to 
or the have the same interface to, to that data structure. Um, I don't know if people in this room are agreeing with me, but uh, it seems like not having a language level uh, control over the memory mm -hmm. that we have is, is the primary reason. Uh, well, if actually, I think you should criticize me and not criticize Haskell because that's that's new research that hasn't even landed in Haskell yet, right? Um, so uh, that is in some ways describing our future work uh, because once you have one of these packed representations, first of all, I'm not familiar with any API in any language that lets you work with these kinds of packed representations of union types uh, because it's very hard to do while. Uh, well, without having some very powerful types, like session types or protocols, because it's this issue of initializing memory. And once I start writing out a tree to the memory stream, I now have this contract that I need to initialize its left child and then its right child in order. So you need a pretty complicated typing scheme if you want to do it safely. And that's exactly the kind of thing we're doing. So future iterations of our system, even if, they aren't, even if the optimizations are still in a separate compiler and not baked into the GHC mainline, uh, we are trying to integrate better with Haskell. And so then these distinctions would actually pop up at the type level. So you'd have a T data type, and then you'd have a packed T data type. And you could write type safe code against packed T directly using these sort of fancy cursors into a buffer. But it's very tedious. And I want to write entire large compilers and then compile them to be very efficient tree traversals. So I don't want to be mucking around with like this low level cursor, uh, cursor modification within a buffer. I want to just write the natural recursive function as a T arrow T type and then call this magic compiler optimization to derive for me the pack t arrow pack t type. Uh, and that would give you kind of, I think, the best of both worlds, where you could derive those pack t pack t transformations automatically, but you could also drop down and write something at that lower level representation if you want to, hopefully type safely. <laughs> but if you're familiar with any related work where people have done that kind of packing, I would love to see it. Chris Latner, the LVM guy, as well as Vikram Adve, they have done work on automatic pooling uh, to automatically take C++ objects that are not uh, connected in the heap graph and put them in separate pools, kind of automatic arena allocation, but that still leaves the normal heap representation. Whatever pointers you had, you still have. So it doesn't do this kind of pre-order serialization packing thing. So following on on this packing thing, <laughs> um, it seems like the decision to pack or not to pack is not always obvious. Uh, and I was wondering if you are planning some kind of Yeah. Because, I mean, having to manually do that is, is fraught with, you know, uh, good intentions. <laughs> <don't>, uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, to me, this touches on these classic questions of compiler optimization. How much should they be under programmer control? How much should they not be? Uh, how do you achieve predictability for your performance tuner? Um, so uh, our initial prototype is just trying to get this idea off the ground. We're basically assuming the data type is only packed and trying to get these traversals to compile with this radical transformation of the code. Um, but in future iterations, certainly, we, uh, I did my thesis on profile-driven optimization. I love profile-driven optimization. And I would love to have a compiler that can make intelligent decisions about data representation based on profiling data, either offline or online. Um, but that's, that's sort of a big future research agenda to get to. Sure, sure. So yeah, metaprogramming kind of falls in different categories here. There's template metaprog up at the top. So this is the thing that's most uh, closely explicit metaprogramming, where you're like scheme macros or like explicit templating, you're having multiple stages of program execution. So you run a Haskell program at compile time that's generating another Haskell program. So that's our, uh, our explicit metaprogramming story. Uh, type level programming ties into some of these questions about verifying things in the, in the type system. So that type families example that I mentioned uh, as a cross-fertilization example is one place where Haskell introduced type-level functions. So instead of a vector of int just always uh, meaning the same thing, whether it's a vector int or vector double, vector could actually be a type-level function that uses a completely different implementation strategy for a vector of int as vector of double. Of course, people in the C++ community are familiar with that kind of thing from templating. Um, so we have that kind of ability. There are even some nascent support out there for lifting Haskell functions to the type level so you can use the same function at the type level and at the value level. That's the kind of thing that eventually gets us towards this dependent typing idea. In the dependent typing world, there is no strict distinction between types and terms. <laughs>
uh, the, two, the two levels are kind of merged completely. And that's where we're headed. Thank you.